I'm Sandy Ritchie. I'm a linguist at Google. I work in this, the speech department. And my main responsibility is working on speech recognition for uh, new languages, which Google currently doesn't support. So a lot of my job is uh, finding out, you know, there are very basic things about the phonology, certain things about the writing system, um, how they say things like numbers, um, in order to create V0 speech recognition systems for, for new languages. And today, um, I thought it would be interesting to kind of uh, complement the, the talks about Persephone with um, a talk about a, uh, another aspect of speech recognition, which is kind of complementary and would work very well in tandem with, with Persephone in, in certain situations. Um, it's got a kind of a uh, technical title. That I'm going to talk about <laughs> grapheme to phoneme conversion, which is the process of changing spellings into phonemic transcriptions. So transcriptions of pronunciations um, using finite state transducers, which are a type of, um, let's say, grammar or machine, machine grammar, which you can use to convert from spellings to pronunciations. <clears throat> so I'll just give a very brief overview of how uh, automatic speech recognition, or ASR, I'll probably say ASR a lot, so that's automatic speech recognition, or text-to-speech, TTS, uh, works. Then I'll talk a bit more about how grapheme to phoneme or G2P conversion works. Then I'll talk a bit about uh, what fi finite state transducers or FSTs are. <laughs> and then I'll, I'm going to talk a bit in a bit more depth about Tibetan and why it's like a super interesting case. And it's been a real interesting challenge for us to work on Tibetan uh, G2P. Um, so how does ASR work? Basically, I mean, this is like abstracting a lot. At a very high level, you know, it's, it's audio in and well-formed formatted transcriptions out. And in most uh, state-of-the-art ASR systems, you have three uh, subparts, three subcomponents of, of, of the system. It doesn't match. The text doesn't match the audio. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can read uh, waveforms, can you? <laughs> 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 I have no idea. I just found it on the internet. <laughs> 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 um, so yeah, there are three sort of sub-components of an ASR system. So you have the acoustic model that will get you from the sound waves to phonemic transcriptions. And that's basically, this is, like, this is Persephone, right, within this system. That's, that's what Persephone is doing. It's taking you from audio to phonemic transcriptions. Then you have the pronunciation model, which takes your phonemic transcriptions and turns them into uh, possible spellings of that phonemic transcription. And then you have a language model, which disambiguates between possible hypotheses or possible like variant transcriptions. So if I say your book, the, the sound gets turned into the transcription your and book, and then the pronunciation model will change your into your or your, but it doesn't know which one, it will just give you both. And then the language model will choose between your and your, depending on uh, basically its, its context within the sentence. So it's called an n-gram model. So it's looking at the, the words proceeding and following to any n, any n degree in order to find out which is the best hypothesis for the, for the pronunciation. So yeah, uh, the previous talks were about the acoustic model, really, and that's what Persephone is, and I'm going to talk mostly about the pronunciation model today, and we'll t maybe talk a little bit about the language model at the end. Uh, synthesis, or TTS, text-to-speech, is basically the same thing, kind of in reverse. So you have text in and audio out. So you take a... a a well-formatted string like 12 minutes. And the first thing to do in, in text-to-speech is to change things like uh, one, two into the word 12. That's, that's a process called text normalization. And then after normalization, that, those, those uh, um, let's say, written, written, written form of the spoken speech is turned into uh, phonemic transcriptions. And then you have a synthesis model which will turn that phonemic transcription back into audio. So it will speak back to you. Um, so if you say something to your Google Home or your Alexa, I'm not going to promote Google Home over Alexa, then <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you can say, well, set my alarm. And then some NLU, NLP magic happens in the middle, which I don't really know about. And then it will say, I've set your alarm. OK, so the pronunciation model in particular. It's generally, in most uh, production systems, made up of two components, a lexicon and a graphene to model, or a GTP. 
So the lexicon is very, very high quality, hand curated phonemic transcriptions of spelled words in the language. So these are made by linguistic experts who have training in transcription of, of phonemic transcription. And they will produce really, really good quality uh, transcriptions for words like this, which is pronounced kernel. You wouldn't guess it from the spelling. And that's why we need a lexicon, because it is almost impossible to guess that that word is spelled, is pronounced uh, kernel from the spelling. Um, the, 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 the pros of a lexicon are that it's really high quality and it's very reliable. You can almost certainly rely on it to get the pronunciation right. The cons it is that it's static, so uh, new words, neologism, slang, non-standard words are not included usually in the lexicon. And it's extremely expensive because you have to pay linguistic, people have linguistic training to hand transcribe every single word. Um, so to complement the lexicon, we also have another component called a, a GTP, or a graphene to phoneme converter. And that is a basically a, a rule-based or machine learned model, which will learn or learn how to produce uh, pronunciations or phonemic transcriptions for words that aren't in the lexicon. So I don't know if anyone <laughs> knows this word. I found it on the internet. Anyone? Apparently it means flirting in like London slang. I didn't, I didn't know either. That's unlikely. It's unlikely to be in the lexicon, right? It's, it's the kind of thing that someone would say, and then where the lexicon falls down and doesn't have an entry for that word, the GTP will kick in, take over, and try to produce some kind of useful uh, phonemic transcription for the spelling. So the pros of the GTP are that it's very dynamic. It can, it can produce a pronunciation for any word. It's quite cheap, um, but it's unpredictable, and the results are <laughs> let's say <laughs> variable, and depending on the script, it can be you know, really, really bad. So really, like in a, in a, in a production system, you need, you need both. And they, work, they kind of work in tandem together. So the lexicon and the GTP, they complement each other. Where the lexicon falls down, the GTP takes over, and, and vice versa. <clears throat> so let's just talk a little bit more about spelling and pronunciation. I mean, this is like an obvious point to make, but you know, the relationship between spelling and pronunciation is not always predictable. So even in languages with very shallow orthographies, and by shallow I mean that the, the orthography matches quite closely to the phonemic uh, realization of the, of, the, of the language, there are going to be context dependent rules. Take this really simple example in Italian. So Italian N, the grapheme, is pronounced N, the phoneme in this word, naso, which means nose, and in this word, finke, which means until. And in this word, mano, which means hand. So you're like initial, final, medial. It must be N everywhere, right? It is N. It, it just is N. So maybe we can just have like a context independent system and just replace the grapheme N with the phoneme N and we're done. And then you get to the cases like this, where it's part of a, a digraph, GN. And if you try to just map N to N in a context independent way, your system is going to produce ag agnello, which is. Incorrect, okay, that's pronounced. And yellow, it means the lamb, lamb. Um, yeah, so, I mean, given that simple example with a very easy, you know, shallow orthography, think about English words like yacht, or colonel, knight, I mean, you know, you're, you're lost. What, 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 does, what does CH represent in the word yacht, in the pronunciation of the word yacht? I don't know, there must, there must be some L2 learners of English in the room. Any others that you found particularly annoying to remember? O-N-U. O-N-U? Yeah, like and Ah, right, yeah, done and gone, yeah, exactly. Right. The, the same, same spelling, two completely different pronunciations. Or like O-U-G-H, right? Through, bow, cough. Persephone. Persephone, Persephone. Persephone. okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. Eng English is like etymological, right? You have to know about like, Greek, uh, Greek orthography to be able to give pronunciations to English words. Yeah. OK, so yeah, graphing to phoneme conversion. Um, there's various ways to do it. It's not just like one, one size fits all. So the, the, the most like, common is, is to use a machine learning model. And for that, you need lots of data. So you basically already need a pre-existing pronunciation lexicon. So uh, just a, a, a lexicon is just like a huge list of mappings between spellings and phonemic transcriptions. And if you have that, then you can like train a, a GTP model. And it'll, it's just like a sequence-to-sequence -sequence problem. So you can see 
this spelling corresponds to this phonemic transcription in all these different contexts, and it just learns to produce the correct phonemic transcriptions for, for any word. But of course, what, you know, in, in many situations, we don't have that yet. And in fact, that's what we need to make right, in order for, to, to get a system going. So um, it's not viable for many, or even like probably most languages in the world. I mean, there are 7,000 languages in the world. Uh, Google, I think, ASR, for ASR, we support something like 120. So that's you know, not even like 10% or something. You know, it's very, very few. In the, if you think about it in terms of the number of languages. Of course, in terms of the number of speakers, we're, we're already covering like, quite a large part of the population just with those 120 languages. So yeah, as an alternative to machine learning models, uh, you can also use a rule-based rule approach. So this is like super cheap. You just need one linguist to sit down, study the phonology, study the orthography, come up with a system which will allow you to generate uh, phonemic transcriptions for, for spellings. Um, and yeah, there are various ways to, to produce a, a rule-based GTP. You can use ICU, ICU rules, which are um, produced by Unicode, but like I, I've tried and they're very, they're very hard to read. And it's hard to read other people's rules if you don't have a pre-existing knowledge of their mind and the language and many other things about the system. <laughs> You could, yeah, you could also use regular expressions, which are kind of you know context-dependent uh, replacements that you can use. But that is like even harder. It's like almost impossible to read. If you, as soon as it gets complicated, you know you, you're lost, and the code the code would be unmaintainable. Trying to fix a bug in someone else's regular expression, like forget it. So yeah, the best thing to do if you if you want to make a rule-based system is to use finite-state transducers written in two languages or, or two implementations of the same language which are Thrax and Pinini. So Thrax is like a custom uh, implementation of finite state transducers, and Pinini is like uh, another implementation of that which you can import into like a Python uh, library, uses a Python library, so you can use it within Python. So yeah, like finite state transducers written in Thrax are super easy, super fun, and it's, it's a really interesting problem to use. So I'll just talk a bit about that. You can see I'm a bit biased. <laughs> So, FSTs uh, operate on strings. Okay, I'm gonna, this, is, this is like the terminology dance, so <coughs> here, here it comes. Strings can be characters, single characters, words, sentences, or text, so any, any level of uh, you know, character-based input. Um, and FSTs operate on a string, so they take a string and they either change it, let it pass unchanged, or you know, fail, like refuse, refuse the string. Okay, so there are various types of FSTs. So the main one, of course, is the, is the actual transducer. So a transducer takes an input like fish and it produces an output like the phonemic transcription of fish. So that's what a transducer does. It changes a string into a different string. An acceptor, which is also an FST. Okay, all of these are FSTs. It's, this is a bit confusing, but it's just it's, it's worth getting your head around. Acceptor, it takes a string and it just, just returns the same string. Okay, so it is a transducer, but all it's doing is mapping from the thing to itself. Okay, that, that's called an acceptor. Then you have union, which is collections or sets of FSTs. So you can say something like, it's like or, right? So fish or eggs, that, that, that's an FST. So it's like a union of two things together. And then there's concaten conc concatenation, which is uh, strings like appended to other strings. So it's like a bit like and. So you have fish and then the suffix y. So those two things concatenated together will give you a new string, fishy, right? And then finally, uh, a bit more complicated, there's, there's composition. Well, I'll talk about this in a bit more detail um, uh, in a minute. That's sort of chaining together one FST after the other produce, to produce an, a larger FST. So this is like really basic uh, computer theory. I mean, I'm a linguist, and I, <laughs> I did my PhD about language documentation. So you know, I, I, I'm not necessarily the world's leading expert in this. but so if you have A to B, and then you compose A to B with B to C, then your re result will be A to C. So you get all the way from A to C by composing those two rules together. Um, and finally, yeah, there's context-dependent rewrites, which are basically just transducers, so changing one string to another string, plus some context in which the change should occur. And context-dependent rewrites are really the ones which are crucial for the graphene to phoneme problem. OK, so here's a context-dependent rule written in Thrax. 
So, <clears throat> okay, forget kernel, forget yacht. We're, ne we're never going to get there. Like, it's just not going to work. You, just ha you have to enter those in the lexicon. There's no GTP rule that you can write which will allow you to produce the pronunciation for that spelling. But for a word like night, okay, let's, let's like, think about what, what we can do. Right? It is possible to get from the spelling K-N-I-G-H-T to the, to the phoneme transcription N-A-I-T. Okay, that's, what we, that's what we're after. Okay, so first of all, we need to deal with the, the silent K, okay? So, in a CD rewrite, this is the definition of a CD rewrite. We have a transducer, so we're gonna rewrite KN, the string, to N on its own. And we're gonna give it a preceding context, and a following context, and a field within its searching, okay? And in this case, our preceding context is the beginning of the string, so we know that it happens only at the beginning of the word, and you'll see why that's important in a minute. And then the following context is always going to be a vowel, okay? So you can't have K and another consonant. Okay, these, are, these are really like, I mean, this, is, this is shorthand, but these are like acceptors of the beginning of the string and any English vowel grapheme, okay? So A, E, I, O, U. <coughs> and then this one, which is a bit, which is a bit like confusingly named, that's just, that's just a convention. It just means like any Unicode character or a space. So it's like the field in which you're searching or like looking to do this to do this transaction, so that any character that you like can can be accepted by this rule, and and will put so any string will be allowed to pass through in any language, in any script, in any writing system. Okay, so with this rule, we can get we can now get to n i g h t, but we're not quite there yet because we need another rule for the 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 bit in the middle. So <coughs> we have a second rule, which is another CD rewrite, and it's basically going to rewrite IGH to AI for the phonemic transcription night. And the left context in this case is a consonant, and the right context in this case is a, is a union of a consonant or the end of the string, okay? So it can either be a consonant on the right or the end of the string, the end of the word. And again, we have the same search field, any Unicode character. And now, with, the, with just those two rules, you can take this string, okay, so, so yeah, this is, a bit, this is a bit confusing, but a string is an FST, which is an acceptor of itself. So this is an FST, and it, it takes its spelling in, and it just gives you the spelling back out. Okay? Then you compose that FST with the rewrite KN rule. So that's an FST. This is an FST, this is an FST, and now this is an FST, so A to B. And then you take that FST, and you compose it with the IGH rule. So now you've got A to B to C, so A to C, and this whole thing is an FST, and it will spit out hopefully, the correct output, the, the phonemic transcription, night. So we've got, with just two rules from the spelling, which is nothing like the pronunciation, to the correct pronunciation, okay? And what's really crucial and important to remember is that you can apply these rules, hopefully, to any English word, and they will always produce the correct phonemic transcription if those sequences are in there. And it won't misproduce bad transcriptions Okay, so take an example like breakneck. <clears throat> I'll just give you a minute. If you, want to, if you want to write it down, okay, look at breakneck and think about using this rule, why breakneck won't be changed by this rule. You can shout it out. The K doesn't appear at the beginning of the word. Exactly, okay? So it's, in the, it's, it's string medial. Okay, it's not at the beginning of the string. So if you, if you pass breakneck to the rewrite KN rule, it's just going to pass it unchanged, okay? So we're not inappropriately rewriting this thing, which is actually a coder and an onset, on an onset into a, a just, just an onset. And, it, and it's exactly the same way if you pass a string like <laughs> pig headed, which I spent a long time looking for. <laughs> what, what, what's, what's wrong with this? What, what, why, why won't the IGH rule change pig headed? Because, okay, it's got, a, it's got a consonant on the left. So there's some correct context, mm -hmm. but on the right? Okay, it's, yeah, exactly, there's a, there's a vowel. It's not the consonant, it's not the end of the string. So again, it's just gonna pass through unchanged. So, th you know, this, this works, this little toy FST, it works beautifully, there's no, there's no problems, no exceptions. Can anyone think of any exceptions? I, I couldn't. Are there, are there any exceptions to this in English orthography? I was trying to think about it. You know, like, so I, I added end of the string here because you might have, like, a thigh, right? Thigh. 
IGH and then the end of the string. So it's not necessarily a consonant following, it could be the end of the string. But I don't think there's any other problems with it. I mean, it's just a toy example. We don't actually use GTP for English. <laughs> it would be terrible. <laughs> yeah, so FSTs for GTP, so finite state transducers for graphene to phoneme conversion. The pros are that it's deterministic, so it's always, like I said, it's always going to get it right. There's never going to be any exceptions. It's lightweight, it's small, it's cheap, and it really works. It works really well, even for languages which have, you know, large dis discrepancies for, between spelling and pronunciation, as long as the correspondences, as we're going to see, are fairly regular. The cons are that, you know, I said before that it's, you know, easy and fun to read, but even even with this, you know, nice context-dependent rewrite language, like, it can get extremely difficult to read, and people do all kinds of interesting things with them, which maybe you oughtn't do, and it, is quite, it can become quite hard to read. Um, it, is, it is sometimes quite inaccurate due to time constraints, like the complexity of the writing system or the, or the phonology, um, and it, does, yeah, it doesn't really handle exceptions very well. So if you have some kind of lexical exception to your rule, then you just have to, you know, it, basically like that's where you'd need a lexicon. That's where the GTP won't, won't really work. Um, yeah, it definitely doesn't really work very well for messy orthographic systems like, like English or French or there are many other cases. But let's try Tibetan. Okay, so before I start, uh, who knows much about Tibetan in the room? Okay, a few. So this is going to be like really boring and basic for you guys and super complicated for everyone else. <laughs> Tibetan orthography is, wow, I've never seen anything like it. Okay, first thing to say, it's a Brahmic Abhigita, or alpha syllabary. If you don't know what that means, Brahmic means that it's derived from uh, Sanskrit originally, and an alpha syllabary means like, um, but like in modern Devanagari, so you don't write um, the inherent vowel, so you mostly just write consonants, um, and unless, the cons unless the vowel is not <coughs> a or a, then you would write a diacritic to represent e or u. So it's mostly like consonants and an inherent vowel. Um, the current standard for Tibetan emerged in the 9th century and has not uh, changed since then, barely at all. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so yeah, the, the written and spoken forms of, of words now differ you know, wide, widely. So there are many silent letters like the K in night, you know, English example, and lots of sound changes, so vowel, consonant changes between the spelling and the, and the pronunciation. But unlike English, what's really interesting about Tibetan is that the correspondences between the spelling and the pronunciation are mostly uh, quite regular and, and predictable. So it is possible to write a, a GTP for Tibetan with, with a rule-based approach. I mean, I'm not recommending it, you know, as the optimal solution. Probably it's better to just pay or find a lexicon or pay people to, to write pronunciations. But this, this is what we can do, you know, in, in a in a low resource situation. So it's good. It's good to sort of think about this, even in a complicated case. Okay. So this is what a Tibetan syllable looks like. <coughs> so um, Tibetanists can. Wh wh what is this word? Sorry, I don't have the, the transcription. Drumton. Drumton. So we have. And um, how many of these letters are actually pronounced in that? philosophical question. <laughs> <laughs> You'll see what I mean in a minute, okay? It's just, it's just like as a high level like introduction. You usually have what's called a prefix. There's nothing to do with morphology, okay? It's something to do with the orthography. It means like a silent letter at the beginning. This is, this is like a vowel diacritic. Then you have like a root, a root character which is probably pronounced, but maybe not pronounced the way you think it might be. Then you have a subscript, so it's like a, another consonant appended to the first one. Then you can have a suffix, okay? And then a secondary suffix, so that's a, that's a syllable. And usually the prefix and the suffix and the secondary suffix are not, not pronounced, so they're all silent. Then, uh, in the second one, you have a vowel character, and then in this case, the main vowel, which is the main, sorry, the main consonant, is not pronounced in this case, so this is a superscript. And actually, this is the root of the word, so the, the appended consonant is the one which is pronounced in this case. So it's like an, another type, and then you have a, a, another suffix. Okay, so yeah, as I said, inherent, like, I'm just going to go through like a few problems in, in Tibetan GTP, just to sort of illustrate the, the complexity of the problem. So yeah, the inherent vowel is not marked in the orthography. So the first thing to do when you're going from graphing to phoneme, okay, first you need to 
convert every single letter in the Tibetan string to a Latin character, but then you need, you need to do some insertion rules to, to add the vowels, right? So that's, that's like the first problem. So this is, this is what is actually written here, ber and we, need, we, want, we want it to say da. Okay, forget about BR for now. We want to add that A after the D. And the same thing here. There's no, there's no vowel in this. So we want to add that A there. <clears throat> That's the easy bit. Okay, there are special rules for this initial DB sequence. So if you have DB at the beginning, uh, it can be, so the D is not pronounced, and then the, the B can be lenited to the W, or uh, just delete it all together. So this, this one is D, B, U, S, and it's pronounced E. So no D, no B, no S, just E. And the vowel is not even the same as the vowel in the orthography. So there's nothing, there's nothing left from the, from the original text in, in the pronunciation. Uh, suffixes, so they, okay, there's four, there's four types. They can be silent or pronounced, and they can affect the preceding vowel or not. So in this case, we've got uh, B, which is a suffix, which is pron pronounced in this case, and it doesn't affect the preceding vowel. And then here, in this case, you've got L, which is a suffix, and it is pronounced, but it does precede the, the preceding vowel. Okay, so there's special rules about suffixes, and you can group them into those four categories. Uh, prefixes are typically not pronounced, but they can have effects on other sounds. So uh, a preceding uh, glottal, I don't know how, how you call this character. Glottal. Like a glottal. No, no. Well, let's not. So I, I think that's a voiced velar fricative originally. Okay. And have written three articles about it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so yeah, okay. Fine. Yeah. You, can, you, can see, you can see that I'm doing like Tibetan 101, and uh, some people are just shaking their heads and going, what, what is this? <laughs> So in, in the very simplest case, this, this prefix will uh, de-aspirate the, the, the initial consonant. So instead of pen, you have pen, pen. And then here, uh, this, this G, initial G, is also G, N, is not pronounced. Yeah, the, sorry, no, I, I, I'll start again. This is G, and then this is N, and E, R. And the G is not pronounced, but it raises the tone. So this was originally low tone, and it raises the tone. On the, on the vowel in the following consonant. So not pronounced, but having an effect on something way at the end of the string, okay? So imagine, remember in your mind, the CD rewrite, right? How are, you gonna, how are you gonna do that? How do you jump over all the other letters and make sure that that, that tone is raised? But you can, it is perfectly possible to do this with FSDs. Another interesting thing about Tibetan is uh, called consonant stacking. So um, you can stack up to three uh, consonant graphemes, one on top of the other. So this stack is s, p, y, and then e. And I, that, that's right, right? So the e is pronounced after the, the consonant stack, even though it, it occurs on top of it. Don't ask me. Um, here's, that, here's that stack in action. So in this word, um, so the, the, the subscript in this case, which is, help me out. The y, the yeah, the yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah, the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it will be, it will change the, proceed, the, the preceding sound from p to ch. Okay, I don't even know what to say about this. There's no, <laughs> there's no rule. You, you can't call this like affrication or something. So I mean, what does p have to do with ch anyway? <laughs> Here you go from like k r to to t r because because of the the the, the subscript. Right? Am I right? I hope I'm getting this right. <laughs> and then here, yeah, this is, this is my favorite. So z l, so z, with an L subscript, is pronounced d. That's what goes on in Tibetan. That's what, that, that is what's happening in an illiterate Tibetan, a literate Tibetan person's mind when they see the sequence z l, they go, ah, oh, yes, d. <laughs> That's how it is. Superscripts. Uh, a bit like prefixes, so superscripts R and S and L, they raise the tone of vowels following the nasals, but they're generally not pronounced. So this stack, uh, so, yeah, so here the, the superscript S, it raises the tone of the following nasal. 
it raises the tone of the vowel following a nasal. So if you have sir and then a, a nasal, the tone from, will go from low to high. And in this special case, which is the only one, I think, uh, uniquely in this case, this stack, subaya, is pronounced ja. So from subaying, you get jang, jang, jang. Uh, finally, yeah, tone, tone is not overtly marked in orthography at all. So there's no like, you know, overt marking of tone. There's, no, there's nothing in the orthography we can use to, to predict tone, like a, you know, an acute accent or a grave accent in the Latin script system. But we can work out how to insert it in a rule-based manner. So basically, uh, Tibetan consonants are traditionally grouped into four columns based on their manner of articulation. So if you have a, a vowel following a column one or column two, consonant, it will generally have a low tone, whereas three and four vowels following three and four consonants, they generally have a high tone. But you, if you remember, those tones can also be changed by uh, prefixes and, and superscripts. So yeah, I mean, all, the, all that was just to say, you know, this is like an extremely complex case of, of, a, of a, the difference between an orthography and a, and a, and a phonemic transcription. But like even in this case, it is perfectly possible to, to get all the way from graphemes to phonemes just, just with a rule-based system. Um, I'm, I, like, I, we're already relying on like, a lot of work which has been done uh, for the Tibetan script by U the Unicode people and various others. So for example, this stack thing. So um, this is I, S, P, Y, like you know, from top to bottom. But it's rendered already in Unicode as S, P, I, S, P, Y, I. So the vowel is put following the, the consonants. Um, so yeah, the, the, the real key to GTP for Tibetan is to, to classify the graphemes. So for, like, the first pass is just to say, is it independent or, or dependent? So is it appended to another uh, character or is it an independent character? And then like, comes the linguistic knowledge. So is it a consonant or a vowel? Is it a prefix or a root? Is it a suffix? Is it a subscript, a superscript? And then you have many, many, many context dependent rewrites to, to, to deal with all these kind of uh, sound changes, vowel changes, consonant changes. So here's just like a kind of, this, is, this isn't, like, this is like a very, very simplified, abstracted version, but this is what's going on. So each, you can imagine that each of these is an FST, a bit like a context dependent rewrite. So you pass this string B, S, G, R, U, B, S to this rule, and then it will tag all the letters for their status. So from this string, we get like, okay, this one's a prefix, this one's a, su a superscript, that's the root, that's the subscript. And we, so then we know like, what, the, what the class of each, of each character is. Then you just change all the characters to the Latin script. That's like the first thing, the first thing to do to get, from, get, to get to the feeling transcription. Then you want to remove all the silent letters, change the quality of the plosive from G to D, and then remove all the tags, add the final devoicing, and then add the tone marker because we know that it's, it's column three. So you know, each of these is an FST, and if you just chain them all together, then you get all the way from graphemes to phonemes. So it's, and what, what's very important to remember is that if you apply these rules to any Tibetan word, it will hopefully, this and many other rules, it will hopefully produce something like an accurate pronunciation for the, for the word. So, to summarize, uh, I talked a bit about how GTPs fit within pronunciation models specifically and ASR and TTS systems more generally. Uh, I talked about how GTP can be achieved in a rule-based way for languages which have a systematic correspondence between the graphemes and the phonemes or the spelling and the pronunciation. I talked a bit about how you can write uh, GTP rules in Thrax. And then we looked at the issues in Tibetan orthography and uh, gave a simple GTP example for Tibetan. Um, so yeah, if you're interested, you can do this in your own time, maybe. It would be interesting to try and write a context spending rule for Tibetan or any other language that you're interested in. And I guess, like, yeah, I did want to say that in the context of this discussion, I guess what this would, would be really useful for is that if you can create this FST for your language that you're working on in, in your documentation project, then you don't necessarily need to produce uh, <coughs> phonemic transcriptions for your, for your one-hour recording. All you need to do is to get someone who knows the orthography to transcribe it orthographically. Um, and then you probably need to do some kind of normalization on that text in order to get it into a state where the GTP will pass all the words. 
but then you just chuck, chuck that text into the GTP and it will produce all the phonemic transcriptions for you. So this is good in some contexts where maybe you have like lots and lots of recordings and all you have is the orthographic transcription done by a native speaker and there's no analysis. Then use, you can use that data or you can use like the transcriptions produced by your GTP for, for that data and like throw them into your model. And that'll probably make your acoustic model like a lot better if you have like lots of, lots of data like that. So that's like a real important use case for this, this aspect of it. Um, just a couple of resources. If you want to know more about FSTs, go to openfst.org. That's, that's where you can find all the downloads, the resources for uh, producing fracks and piney rewrites. And uh, yeah, I, I found this website really useful when I was looking at Tibetan. So if you're interested, you can go there. Um, I'll say, <laughs> 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 <laughs>